interpreted and shared with external audiences. So as you join, please drop your title and affiliation into the chat so we can get an idea of who uh, you all are since we do have over 300 individuals registered. And uh, you can also tell us where in the world you're zooming in from or WebExing in from. So my name is Lisa Simpson. I'm the president and CEO of Academy Health, which is the National Health uh, uh, National Association for Health Services Research and Health Policy. And I, my background is in pediatrics, health services research and policy. And joining me today as sort of co-efficient is Dr. Lucy Sabitz, who is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh Department of Health Policy and Management in the Graduate School of Public Health the Senior Innovation Advisor for UPMC in their Center for High Value Healthcare and the Vice Chair of the Board of Academy Health. And we at Academy Health are very proud and, and glad to be partnering with HRQ and the SRC. Yes, we do use a lot of acronyms, but I said them out loud first to bring, a, and our role is to bring awareness to and help disseminate the findings from uh, the EBC program, which are so important to helping advance evidence-based practice in this country um, and, uh, and for all populations. Today, the reports we're highlighting focus on maternal health and postpartum care. We will have opportunities for open discussion and Q&A later on, but feel free to use WebEx also has the hand raising feature and as many of you are already doing using the chat feature. Um, so please use all the modalities that are most comfortable for you uh, to engage. Now, Taylor, if you wanna, ah, yes, here is our brief disclosure. Um, is this, oh, is this the disclosure slide? Um, yes, okay. Brief disclosure and reporting of conflicts of interest, of which there were none. There you can read it's small print, but it's all there. Um, and at the conclusion of this webinar, we hope those who are interested in obtaining CME credits will have gained insight into the learning objectives, which are listed here. And of course, we will drop a link um, to the evaluation survey into uh, the chat and follow up afterwards so that those who are seeking CMEs can uh, uh, complete that evaluation. And we always want to hear whether you're getting CME or not, how can we make these uh, uh, opportunities, these grand round uh, gatherings as effective and useful to each and every one of you as possible. So with that sort of logistics and, and uh, setting the stage for today, I'd now like to introduce Jenny Dalton, who is the program officer in the research synthesis and new technology engagement department at the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And she will take a few minutes to discuss PCORI's interest and involvement in the reports that are being highlighted today. And then she will introduce the experts, the researchers and uh, that we will be hearing from today. So. Over to you, Jenny. So I believe Jenny was having um, some audio issues this morning. I have unmuted some of our call-in users. Um, so hopefully, Jenny, um, if you're there, you can go ahead and speak up. Maybe in the interest of time, we should just go ahead and do the introductions. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, I am sorry that we couldn't get Jenny's audio working. Sure. Yeah. Lisa, do you want to do them or do you want me yeah, to? Why don't you go ahead, Lucy? Sure. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Lucy Savitz, and I'm happy to be here with you today. And I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Um, first, we have Dr. Ian Saldana, who's an epidemiologist and evidence-based health researcher with a background in medicine. He's Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Center for Clinical Trials and Evidence Synthesis at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And from 2018 through 22, he was faculty at the Center for Evidence Synthesis and Health and Assistant Director of the ARC Design Brown University Evidence-Based Practice Center, or EPC. He's the principal investigator for the report on postpartum care up to one year after pregnancy. So we'll be really interested in hearing from him today. And next, We've got Dr. Dale Steele, who's a professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics, and also adjunct professor in health science services policy and practice at Brown University. Dale was the first um, principal investigator for the second report being highlighted today. 
titled Management of Postpartum Hypertensive Disorders of Pregnancy. And throughout his career, Dale's research has focused on diagnosis and severity assessment of conditions encountered in his clinical practice of pediatric emergency medicine. And then in addition to our two speakers, it's really my privilege to introduce our two discussants who are gonna be responding um, to these reports in addition to the questions that you'll all be able to raise. First, we have Dr. Rose Molina, and she's joined with Megan McReynolds. Um, Rose is an OBGYN and scholar activist with a passion for applying language and immigration status as critical lenses for understanding and eliminating inequities in maternal health. She's an assistant professor of OBGYN and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School, the faculty director of the health equity theme in the medical language program at Harvard. And she's also the director of OBGYN Diversity, Inclusion and Advocacy Committee at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Megan is director of clinical obstetrics in the practice division of the American College of OBGYN at ACOG and leads the clinical practice guidelines obstetrics committee. She's over, she has over 20 years of experience working in women's health care, specifically working in continuing physician education, immunization, OBGYN workforce projections, and federal and state policy. So two really great discussions to round out um, what we're hearing today. So with that, I'm going to invite Ian to begin. Ian. Thank you, Lucy. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very pleased to be here at these Grand Rounds. Uh, good afternoon from Baltimore. Um, so, um, uh, next slide, please. So, before I dive into the content of this presentation, some um, funding and relevant disclosures. As was said, I'm the uh, principal investigator of the project being described. I did this work when I was at Brown University. Um, um, other than the funding, we, uh, our team does not have relevant disclosures. Um, this project was funded both by ARC and PCORI. So uh, the context for my presentation today is that we um, were contracted to do the systematic review and meta-analysis. Um, it was designed to inform an upcoming um, a called clinical practice guideline on the care of postpartum individuals uh, within one year of delivery. Um, there is an ARC report that is available on the ARC website that's on the left there. There is an associated um, manuscript uh, paper that was published re very recently in JAMA Network Open on a part of the work, which was on health insurance coverage and postpartum outcomes. And there is, as you see on the right here, there's an ongoing piece of work on um, that describes the healthcare delivery strategies that I'll be talking about that's in press at the journal, um, which is obstetrics and gynecology. Um, we, in, as part of this work, address two major questions or what are known as key questions in the ARC program. The first was what healthcare delivery strategies affect postpartum healthcare utilization and improve maternal outcomes within one year postpartum. And the second key, um, well, before I go into the second, there are some specifics about the uh, population and intervention targets we focused on. So we were interested in postpartum individuals within one year of giving birth at any age. Um, and we were interested both in healthy postpartum individuals, so quote unquote, the broader general postpartum population, as well as studies of, of specifically of individuals who are at increased risk of complications due to pregnancy related conditions or conditions that may occur postpartum. Our targets of interest for the interventions we wanted to study were care that was delivered uh, as part of general postpartum care, as well as studies of specific aspects of postpartum care. As you can see here, contraceptive care, breastfeeding care, screening and preventive care. Um, we were interested in seven uh, categories of delivery strategies. We used an existing framework to help think conceptualize these seven strategies. We were interested in where healthcare was provided, such as in a hospital or the clinic, how healthcare was provided, whether it was part of a dedicated postpartum visit or part of a well child visit, when it was provided at various time points, who provides the care, whether it's predominantly health system based care, such as OBGYNs and nurses, or community based care, such as doulas and peer supporters. Um, we're also interested in how care was coordinated or managed, such as through the use of patient navigators. Um, information technology use in care was also of interest, such as texting or um, app-based care. 
Um, and interventions, we were also interested in interventions targeting the providers or systems of care, such as reminders or clinical decision support tools. The other main question in the review, that's the piece of work that was recently out in JAMA Network Open, is does extension of health insurance coverage or improvements in access to care affect utilization of healthcare as well as improve maternal outcomes within postpartum of care, uh, within a year of postpartum? All right, so very briefly, just to summarize the methods, and these methods were pretty much in common to both systematic reviews that you'll hear about today that Dr. Steele will also talk about later. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide just to briefly tell you about how we did this. So we searched, we used standard IHRQ methodology for conducting these systematic reviews, including a rigorous search of the published evidence. We screen for eligibility of the studies based on standard eligibility criteria, such as thinking about the population intervention, comparator, outcome design, timing, and setting. Then we went ahead for the eligible studies, we extracted data, we evaluated the evidence in terms of its quality and rigor by assessing the risk of bias in each study, as well as across studies that addressed a given each relevant outcome we assess the strength of evidence. How strong is the evidence addressing that outcome? Various factors we were considered. We, like we can address this in the discussion if this comes up, but uh, eventually at the end of that assessment, we made conclusions for each outcome as insufficient, low, moderate, or high strength of evidence. Um, and then we conducted syntheses of the evidence as part of that work narratively as well as quantitatively where appropriate. Okay, so what did we include in this systematic review that I'm presenting? So we included for both key questions, we were interested in randomized trials as well as non-randomized comparative studies, whether they be prospective or retrospective. Uh, an important caveat is for key question one, that's those delivery strategies. We were interested from, to maximize the relevance of the evidence to the US context. We focused on studies that were in the US or in Canada. And for key question two, that was the insurance extension question, because of its particular relevance to the US, we only address included studies conducted in the US. Okay, so what did we find for both key questions? So across both key questions, we found 92 studies that were included in the systematic review. 64 of them addressed the first question and 28 addressed the second. Among the 64, we found 50 RCTs and 14 NRCSs, which is non-randomized comparative studies, the bulk of which were either moderate or high risk of bias studies. For key question two, there were no RCTs, but there were 28, all 28 studies were non-randomized comparative studies, um, and again, similar risk of bias uh, distribution. Okay, so let's zoom into question one, which were those 64 studies that we included. You can see here in the rows are those seven delivery strategy um, that we were interested in. And in the columns, you see whether the studies address general postpartum care, which was the mix of these, these various um, aspects of postpartum care or whether they address specific aspects of postpartum care only, whether it be contraceptive care, breastfeeding care, or screening or preventive care. Um, well, one, one of the first things to notice is that 18 out of the 64, that first column, the second column there, that is general postpartum care, only 60, 18 of the 64 studies address the overall general postpartum care. The bulk of the evidence was about breastfeeding care. You see 29 or contraceptive care that was um, 11 studies. Um, there are some gaps here in cells in this table. That's another thing to note. Um, and um, we'll come back to some of these gaps later. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is spend some slides going through uh, each of those rows in, this, in that table, thinking about where care is delivered, how care is delivered, and so on. So this one's about where care is delivered. We found 14 studies. Um, just for to orient you to this sort of slide, you see on the right, you see that color-coded strength of evidence. Remember when I said insufficient, low, moderate, or high strength of evidence in terms of, and those are the colors those correspond to. And then you have direction of effect, the lower on the right there, an upward black triangle is a better outcome, a black rhombus suggests increased harms. 
when you see the tilde there, it suggests comparable outcomes. Questionable is uh, um, the question mark is unclear. And then when there's an up and a down arrow, there's an inconsistent results. So what I'm going to do in the interest of time is I'm going to focus on where we were able to make conclusions. So what you can see here in the pink or the salmon color for healthcare utilization outcomes. In terms of where care is delivered, we found four studies addressing breastfeeding care, whether it was home or at the pediatric clinic. And we found our conclusion there was that the hospital admissions and other unplanned care were comparable, whether it was care was delivered at the home or pediatric clinic. Similarly, for mental health outcomes, for in terms of general overall postpartum care, it did not matter whether the care was delivered at home or the clinic in terms of depression or anxiety symptoms. And uh, for breastfeeding care, uh, similarly, it, it did not matter. So those are the conclusions we were able to make for where care was delivered. Next, please. <laughs> so for one of them, we were able to conduct this meta-analysis where we were able to show that uh, whether breastfeeding care was conducted at home versus at the clinic, um, the, um, the relative risk here of the outcome being um, hospital readmission by three months, it did not matter whether um, breastfeeding care was delivered at the home or the clinic. Um, for in terms of hospital readmission, the relative risk um, crosses one, it's 0 0.90 to 2.13. We can come back to the implication of this finding later. Next, please. All right, shifting gears then to how care was delivered. For here, remember the how is things like whether it was part of a well child visit or there was integration of care. So we found studies that address integration versus non integration of care. And uh, here too, we the only conclude here, we, the only conclusion we were able to make was about mental health. And here, integration versus non integration of care did not uh, impact mental health, the, the, the uh, mental health outcomes of depression symptoms and substance use. Okay. In terms of when care was provided, uh, the bulk of the evidence that addressed this particular delivery aspect of delivery of care was about contraceptive care. So here we were able to make conclusion about contracept conclusions about contraceptive use. Here we found eight studies that addressed that particular outcome, and early contraceptive. Um, initiation was associated with, with better outcomes than later contraceptive initiation. By early in these cases were soon after delivery or within about three weeks and later contraceptive delivery was later periods of time. And here what we found was that um, in, if, if contraception was introduced earlier, that it was associated with comparative, comparable use of intrauterine devices at three and six months. But for implant use, it mattered in that um, early contraception was associated with greater implant use at, uh, at the six month time point. Okay, then in terms of who provides care, the bulk of the of the only real evidence for which we were able to make conclusions in this case was breastfeeding care. Um, so remember, we talked about peer supporters and, um, and system based care, such as. Um, nurses, lactation consultants, et cetera. So in terms of community-based care for peer support, uh, there, there were some nuances in terms of specific how breastfeeding um, care was defined and at what time points and so on. But generally we found that peer support was associated with better outcomes in terms of breastfeeding, um, uh, continued breastfeeding at these, at one month and three to six months and exclusive breastfeeding at uh, one month. And lactation consultant care uh, was associated by, based on seven studies was associated with greater use of a greater proportion of individuals who were breastfeeding at six months, but not at earlier time points, but comparable for other time points. Okay. And then in terms of care coordination or management, we found five studies um, in total. Um, these, we were able to conclude that for as far as screening and testing care, um, screening as testing goes, reminders for uh, postpartum individuals for uh, or, oral glucose tolerance testing uh, were associated with greater adherence to those testing for oral glucose tolerance testing, but not for random glucose or HbA1c testing. Um, and the last uh, 
sort of delivery strategy for which we were able to make a conclusion was on information technology use for breastfeeding care. It did not make a difference in terms of breastfeeding outcomes at three and six months. Okay, we also had a delivery strategy that we were interested in for interventions targeting healthcare providers, but the evidence did not allow conclusions on outcomes the, that we had prioritized, so we did not make any. Okay, shifting gears then to that key question two, which was on health ex insurance extension. So here we were able to make two main conclusions that you can see in the in the report and that JAMA network open paper. Uh, in that health insurance extension, we found 28 studies that, that address this question. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, but important to, to find this sort of an outcome was that greater, more comprehensive insurance was associated with greater attendance at postpartum visits. And it was also associated with uh, fewer preventable readmissions and ER visits um, in, in the follow up time point. So that's what we were able to conclude based on this for this key question. Okay. So here's at a glance, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can have a, this slide is meant to um, provide just a summary of conclusions that we were able to make here. The outcomes are in the rows and then in the columns are the key questions that I just went through and the specific aspects of delivery strategies and so on. There's one of the things just to note, there's a lot of gaps here. There's a lot of NDs where we found no data for specific outcomes and where we found either inconsistent or uh, insufficient evidence to make conclusions based on our systematic review. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now let's take a step back and I'll start to wrap up in terms of what were the strengths of the evidence that we uncovered in this systematic review. So we, uh, an important strength perhaps as a function of how we filtered the evidence to the US decision-making context was its applicability to the US decision-making context. There was a good amount of age and racial diversity of the population studied in the studies in the systematic review, but as, you'll see, as I'll get to in one of the challenges, we were not able to make too many conclusions based on that. Let's go to the next slide. So here are some of the limitations and recommendations for research for key question one. So as I said, this, the, we found limited data on general postpartum care, especially for at-risk populations, which will, be, which is what we are trying to that this work is meant to inform the care of also. So of the 28% of studies that targeted general postpartum, only 28% rather address general postpartum care, and the remaining focused on specific aspects of delivery of, of, of intervention targets. So we found sparse evidence for information technology use for communicate for coordination and management of care, as well as interventions targeting healthcare providers. And despite our finding a good amount of diversity in the study participants in, this, in the results in these studies, the challenge is that the studies do not report adequately on differences among specific subgroups as to how might specific subgroups benefit from um, interventions more than others, example by race. And as you saw in the grays and in the NDs in the previous slide, there's the sparse evidence for many outcomes that we had prioritized. Mind you, I didn't spend enough to mention this, but these outcomes that we have prioritized were based on engaging with various stakeholders before we began the systematic review. Um, and in terms of key question two, in terms of health insurance, here again, we found uh, evidence for those outcomes that I presented, but there was limited data on differences by subgroup of, uh, by population subgroups. And other than the visit attendance and unplanned care utilization, there was sparse evidence for which we, and, and therefore we were not able to make any important conclusions. And finally, I'd like to end on this point that with recent Medicare extend, extension that's happened over the past now year plus in various states, uh, we think that this is an excellent opportunity for researchers to evaluate the impact of these policy changes on uh, postpartum care utilization and not just utilization outcomes, but also the health. To what extent does it actually improve the health in terms of morbidity and mortality, both within the states that are doing this and then across states um, that may be doing this to different extents. Um, and perhaps uh, more, more importantly, that just one last point that do and to what extent do they, if, the, if they do, 
these policy changes help address and reduce the racial and other disparities in postpartum outcomes in the US that we know are really wide. Um, and uh, just before I wrap up, so these, so as it takes a village to do this kind of work. And um, so at the evidence based practice center team, when I was at Brown, um, um, I was there, and then all these co colleagues and collaborators, many of whom are on the call. We had folks from the UNC. Um, Chapel Hill, Michigan, and Yale. And then, of course, many thanks to our task order officer, Dr. Jill Hubbard, and of course to Corey, uh, Jenny Dalton, and Paula Medina, um, and uh, collaborators at ACOG who will use this information to help develop their guidelines. And then, in the, there's too many to name on this slide, but we had um, plenty of folks who um, provided their opinions and expertise to help shape this review. They've been named and acknowledged in that final report. I see there's a link in the chat to that final final report as well. With that, I'll uh, like to thank you for your time. Fantastic, Ian. Um, that was really interesting. And so we're going to start with getting our two fantastic discussants to um, to jump in and give us some of their initial thoughts before we. Uh, hear from the second report and then after have more time for or for dialogue with all of you and really digging into some of the dimensions. But I, I want to underscore the point you made about the opportunity going forward with the Medicaid programs extending postpartum coverage. Um, you know, this is a, an opportunity for natural experiment designs and really helping to give timely relevant evidence for uh, decision makers. So I, I think, um, yeah, we're always looking for ways to strengthen the evidence given the rating of quality that you uh, summarized Ian. But Rose and then Megan, what are you, some of your initial thoughts or reactions to the findings in this report? And I'll turn to Rose first. Sure, thank you. And thank you for inviting me uh, to join you all in this discussion. Um, I will start by just saying that my um, I come to this discussion as an OBGYN working in a federally qualified community health center in Boston. And um, a lot of the comments or my reflections on the reports and the data really are grounded in my clinical encounters with um, my patients in the FQHC. So I just wanted to name that. Um, because that's the perspective that I bring to the conversation. Um, I really applaud this work because it is so needed to really understand what we know and what we don't know about postpartum care in the US. And um, we know that there is a growing um, spotlight on maternal health outcomes um, and really a focus, a very special focus on the postpartum period, which I know ACOG has really elevated as the fourth trimester, um, given that historically, even when I was in residency training, um, the postpartum period was simply deprioritized compared to the period of pregnancy and the more dramatic moments of childbirth. Um, and so there's been a real, uh, a real a national spotlight really um, paid to the importance of the postpartum period and particularly the delayed postpartum period um, up through one year after childbirth. So I think that this um, report is super important to um, showing what we know and what we don't know. Um, my takeaway from all of uh, all of the data is that we still don't know um, what the optimal ways are to deliver postpartum care. And I think that it does need to be individualized um, to each patient's needs um, and preferences. And there's not a one size fits all approach. And I know that that's hard to measure when it comes to health systems research and um, especially doing large um, evidence based systematic reviews. But I do think that given the um, heterogeneity and kind of the noise, it was hard to get a very clear message about what really works in terms of the who, when, what, and where of postpartum care. And so I really feel that postpartum care really does need to be individualized. I do think that uh, we need to be in contact with people before the two week mark. Um, oftentimes we'll see uh, a common structure is to have a universal comprehensive postpartum visit at six weeks. Um, some practices will do a two week visit, but not all practices. Some practices will identify patients with higher risk conditions who 
may qualify for a sooner outreach prior to the six week visit. But I actually think two weeks is still too late. And I think that some of these arguments have been made in even the report that a lot of the challenges around breastfeeding, for example, really start in the first few days to the first few weeks. Um, a lot of the issues around blood pressure, which I'm sure we'll get to soon, um, those things come up before the two week mark. And so I think that there needs to be intentional um, consideration of who needs to be contacted when. And of course, there needs to be longer contact than after the six week mark. And there's been a lot of advocacy around this um, to really think about those critical months after the six weeks, even up to the full year. The other uh, reflection I have as I reviewed those outcomes that um, Ian just reviewed for all of us is that some of those, out those are outcomes that matter to researchers and clinicians and policymakers, but I wonder about the outcomes that matter the most to patients. And so for example, we um, talk a lot about breastfeeding rates, for example, but I know that as, as as someone who speaks to people about their breastfeeding journeys and goals, those vary substantially. And so using a, an outcome that is not actually designed by patients, or at least with patient input, I think um, is somewhat flawed. And there are opportunities for improvement in terms of thinking about how do we measure goal concordant breastfeeding rates and duration of goal concordant breastfeeding over time. Um, how do we think about, for example, contraception goals and how those change over time? Uh, and I think that because of the limitations of our large data sets, we're not really able to explore um, some of those really important outcomes that matter the most to our patients. So I think that that is um, something we should keep in mind. The last uh, reflection I'll share uh, about this is really um, what I didn't see uh, as part of the analysis is how do we how are we addressing the larger structural determinants of health um, in the context of all of the different ways in which healthcare delivery occurs? And I saw there was that one part around integrated care, coordinated care. But I think what really matters again from a patient perspective is are patients with particular social needs being, referred and do they referred to specialists who have um, expertise in navigating their social needs and are those referrals completed? It's not just identifying a need, it's also ensuring that the referral happens and that the need ultimately is addressed. And as I mentioned, as a clinician in a federally qualified community health center, what I hear every day is about the housing crisis, particularly in the urban area where I work. And so where do those issues come into the comprehensive postpartum care um, visit and are those uh, being addressed? And so it gets into kind of like the quality and the content of the visit. And do we have systems in place to really address these much larger issues that we know actually drive the majority of health outcomes. So housing insecurity, food insecurity, job insecurity, social support, all of which we know are really, uh, the postpartum period is a really vulnerable time for all of those things, um, given the transition to parenthood, given that people often may change jobs during that time, given sort of the overwhelming need for social support um, during that time. So it just made me think about all of the content of postpartum care, which we aren't able um, to fully capture in the data. Great, thank you, Rose, for the, those uh, reflections. Very, very helpful. I'm sure it's prompted a lot, lot of ideas for folks when they we give you all a chance to, to jump in. But I wanna turn next to Megan and get some of her initial reactions to Ian's report again before we turn to Dale. Megan? Thank you so much. So I think Rose covered it all, so she can drop the microphone and, and you know, covered everything I wanted to say. Um, so I just come at it from a little bit different angle and that's clinical guideline development. So I was involved with, you know, in the nomination of this topic and really how we wanted to frame this and working with the amazing staff at ARC and Corey to come forward with this. And um, this report is incredibly important as we think of postpartum care and really trying to shift the mindset away from it's a six week window to it's a year. And there's a lot we need to consider in that year and looking at the patient um, throughout that whole process and considering social determinants of health. And, uh, you know, Rose really covered it all. This is critically important as we really, we do look at the prenatal care 
cycle and the timing and also looking at that fourth trimester over the year. And I was really glad to also see um, mental health brought up in this. This is an incredibly important topic that we're seeing more and more of, thankfully. And it is something that, you know, may not show up at the six week mark, but needs to be considered throughout the year following. And, you know, also one thing that ACOG we look at is um, pregnant individuals showing up in non obstetric settings in the 1 year postpartum period. And how do we work across with various specialties to account for pregnancy when those patients show up in different settings um, in that 1 year period? So incredibly important report. And I'm um, very grateful for everyone we worked with on it. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Megan. And thanks for, for mentioning other non OBGYN providers as a pediatrician. You know, you're seeing the kid frequently in that first year of life um, if it was a, 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 a live birth. So, okay. So I get to now um, call on uh, Dale to get into the second report. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, appreciate the call out to the pediatricians. Uh, I, as as was as I was introduced, uh, I've, I've I work uh, collaborate with people at the Brown Center for Evidence Synthesis and Health, uh, based in the School of Public Health, over my shoulder here. I'm perched on the Providence Bridge, um, and have been very happy to learn from and collaborate with the outstanding group at Brown. Next slide. Uh, I'll skip over many of these slides quickly because they're identical to Ian's. Uh, would particularly uh, appreciate acknowledging that. Sorry, this is uh, so. Uh, by way of context, uh, if you could go back just a little bit more slowly for the last few slides, uh, I'll just end one more. Would definitely want to acknowledge the, the team, both at Brown and our technical experts, uh, subject matter experts, uh, David Niebuhr, uh, Anjali Jane at HRQ, and Jenny Dalton at PCORI, and then, of course, our ACOG representatives and the many unnamed um, key informants, tech members, peer reviewers, and et cetera. Next slide. So, this report is uh, published on the HRQ website. Next slide. And the context for this, we've elected to pick the first key question, uh, one of three uh, to focus on for this discussion. And uh, as with Ian's, it's designed to inform an ACOG clinical practice guideline. And we'll focus today on postpartum home blood pressure monitoring. I'll note that uh, a manuscript uh, uh, was published ahead of print uh, just in time yesterday late afternoon in the Green Journal. Uh, we can provide a link for that. We looked exclusively uh, for key questions one and two at the postpartum period, um, that is after delivery. Key question three involved this elusive peripartum period during which magnesium sulfate is given. Next slide. And we'll focus today on what are the effectiveness, comparative effectiveness and harms of home blood pressure monitoring uh, or telemonitoring in postpartum individuals. Key question two is somewhat related, and we can perhaps allude to some of the overlap uh, related to the effectiveness, comparative effectiveness, and harms of pharmacological treatments for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy in postpartum individuals. And then key question three related to magnesium sulfate regimens. Next slide. We did attempt in the discussion to provide some context for how race, ethnicity, and social determinants of health relate to disparities uh, in incidence and detection, access to care, follow-up care, and clinical outcomes. Uh, but for key question one, we uh, looked, uh, as Ian has nicely described, in the methods for um, randomized controlled trials that uh, enrolled at least 10 individuals per treatment group or non-randomized comparative studies that were prospective or ret retrospective and used some sort of statistical technique or design to reduce bias due to confounding. For key question one only, uh, we amended the protocol to add 
single group studies that attempted to enroll uh, at least 50 uh, individuals uh, who were offered some sort of home blood pressure monitoring. This is a busy slide and it's probably in the time allotted not possible to summarize the evidence, but the first thing to notice is that it was quite sparse. So with respect to effectiveness questions, so were, was home blood pressure monitoring via some sort of smartphone app or texting more effective than usual office-based follow-up, uh, early office-based follow-up as recommended by ACOG. For this question, we found uh, two RCTs only and one NRCS. The first RCT with nine, that enrolled 91 British women, uh, all of whom were receiving any hypertensive medications and home blood pressure pressure monitoring was used to uh, self-titrate dosing. The other two uh, effectiveness trials uh, looked at uh, <clears throat> comparing uh, texting uh, uh, with home blood, uh, and in one case, uh, and, and, uh, somewhat more sophisticated technology uh, with usual care. And then for the comparative effectiveness questions, which I think will become increasingly important. Uh, we found one as yet unpublished study with results in clinicaltrials.gov uh, that looked at comparing individuals who had a tablet-based uh, recording system for home blood pressure monitors versus uh, individuals who had just been provided with a, a cuff um, and a paper log. Uh, and then finally, there was a um, pre-post study that looked at during the, the COVID uh, pandemic, audio only telehealth meeting, telephone conversations uh, to individuals who had a home cuff uh, versus those who just had a paper log. And then finally, we had seven, you found seven studies that we somewhat arbitrarily uh, described as either feasibility, implementation, or quality improvement studies. Um, and uh, we didn't use these to make re recommendations, but included them uh, for the as demonstration of sort of the heterogeneity and creativity that's been uh, used. Next slide. Um, so, in terms of conclusions, uh, we were able to really make two conclusions. First, uh, first of all, that home blood pressure monitoring probably increases submission of blood pressure medicine measurements during the recommended time intervals. Uh, and second, that home blood pressure monitoring probably compensates for racial disparities in office-based follow-up. So in the, in the trial, it, it's well known that there are disparities in office-based follow-up by race, and that seemed to be much less true for individuals uh, who participated in these home blood pressure monitoring trials. In general, uh, there was some evidence that more blood pressure medicines uh, med, uh, me measurements were submitted, it, that patients were satisfied, and that um, the rate of initiation of blood pressure treatment uh, might not be terribly different, and unplanned hypertension-related hospital readmissions might not be different. Next slide. Um, what, in terms of strengths, uh, I borrowed this slide from the HeartSafe Motherhood website um, and stole their pictures, but the, much of the evidence relates to the HeartSafe Motherhood program, which has been evaluated now in both a randomized clinical trial and in single and in multi-center cohorts. Uh, I included these pictures to note that this is a relatively low-tech approach where uh, the postpartum individual receives a text, a reminder text, and then literally transcribes the results from the cuff uh, into a text message back to the provider. Next slide. There were other uh, programs that used a variety of uh, systems and methods. In many cases, they also engaged in titration or initiation of, of hyper, antihypertensive medications. Um, and again, note that there was a single comparative effectiveness trial, uh, which strongly supported, again, the remote communication of blood pressure medicines versus relying on patients 
uh, to Paul with results um, from a home, uh, from a cuff uh, that they recorded on a paper log. In general, the limitations were that these are quite small sample sizes and were not powered to detect differences in patient outcomes. They enrolled participants primarily uh, who were higher risk and either had chronic hypertension, uh, gestational hypertension, or some, some other hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, and were enrolled primarily in urban academic medical centers. Uh, and in some of the implementation trials, uh, there were relatively low en enrollment rates, which may have been confounded with uh, interest in participating in research, but may reflect some implementation challenges. Next slide. So, in conclusion, uh, home blood pressure monitoring with moderate strength of evidence uh, probably increases ascertainment of blood pressure, uh, allowing early recognition of hypertension in postpartum patients, and use of these home blood, blood pressure monitoring strategies may compensate for racial disparities in office-based follow-up. Next slide. A uh, couple of... Uh, sort of discussion points that we that came up frequently for us is one is that this is you know we ascertained blood pressures uh and it's clear that this is necessary likely important uh but by no means sufficient to reduce downstream effects on maternal morbidity and mortality and really must be combined with access to a healthcare professional uh both for medication initiation and titration and then availability of further urgent or even emergent evaluation and treatment if needed. Next slide. Um, I, I saw the comment in the chat about sort of absence of effect or, uh, and, and I think the relationship with healthcare utilization is likely to be complex. Early recognition of hypertension, effective communication and initiation of treatment potentially can and should reduce the need for hospitalization. Uh, but some very high risk individuals uh, in certain symptoms uh, may actually need to, um, it may actually increase appropriate utilization. Uh, and so depending on the system and the subset of population studied, uh, one may not always expect decreased use or decreased costs. Next slide. This is really just uh, a recognition of the limitations of systematic reviews. We um, have a end search day and, uh, and then in very active areas, papers keep coming out. And I just wanted to highlight two. Uh, the first one, actually, I won't claim to uh, review it, but does appear to address, at least in a claims-based study, the associ association uh, with adverse outcomes. And then the second one highlights uh, one of the limit, one of the other limitations, which is that um, most of the studies we found talked about early, uh, early postpartum period, generally the first 10 days to three weeks. And um, subsequent um, papers have looked at the relatively high, quite high incidence of persistent hypertension uh, during that uh, fourth trimester. Uh, and uh, again, identify opportunities for um, use of both blood pressure monitoring and lifestyle intervention. Thanks very much. Dale, thank you very much. T terrific um, uh, summary. And uh, we're going to invite, I'm going to invite Megan and Rose to again jump in before we open it up for general moderated discussion. So let me start with uh, Megan this time and then Rose. So Initial reactions to this presentation from Dale. Again, a really wonderful report, and it was a it was a wonderful project to work on with this team, and it's a critical piece in the larger hypertension and pregnancy and postpartum that we need to know more about. And home blood pressure monitoring is part of that um, hypertension and pregnancy and postpartum that we need to think more about. And I was really um, happy to see that. You know, things like patient patient satisfaction and feedback were included. 
um, the recommendation regarding um, reducing racial disparities um, in the office setting. That was really, really great to see. So this is something that um, we're just we're grateful to see this piece come out because I think it's really a critical piece to consider when we look at guideline development at ACOG. Thank you, Megan. Rose. Yes, I will also um, echo those thoughts by saying this is clearly a super important topic, um, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic, which moved us rapidly into the virtual and telehealth space, making um, home monitoring for a large number of health conditions um, a reality. And um, this is definitely a needed systematic review to understand what we know and what we don't know around um, not just the implementation, but the potential for improving outcomes. Um, I, what I found most powerful uh, was the finding around uh, the potential for home blood pressure monitoring to reduce disparities between Black and non-Black patients in adherence to the blood pressure monitoring uh, program. And I think that there, while we still need a, an evidence base around um, the impact on longer term outcomes, I think that it's important to name that giving patients opportunities to manage their own bodies um, in a way that removes other barriers to accessing healthcare is important. And so um, for people, we know that postpartum, coming to postpartum visits is kind of like flipping a coin. Um, I think that the national studies have shown anywhere between 40 to 60% of people are able to actually come to their in-person postpartum visits um, due to the variety of priorities that are happening um, at that time period after birth. And oppor to opportunities to really think about innovations in what we can do at home effectively and how we can engage patients in their care in terms of taking their own blood pressure and communicating that to their care team, um, not just in the intrinsic value that has uh, in terms of giving that kind of knowledge and skill to individuals, but also in the context of people who've given birth often are the better rocks for their families. And so it's a skill that might have other spill positive spillover effects um, in terms of then being able to take other people's blood pressures in urgent situations. And it also addresses this issue of um, access, as I mentioned, to postpartum care, um, oftentimes due to competing uh, barriers around who's going to watch the newborn or the baby um, when they go to the visit, uh, do they have transportation? And then sometimes, um, particularly around minoritized communities, when there are trust barriers and there's mistrust about going to a clinic visit, um, if there's a way that people can engage in um, healthcare related behavior from the privacy of their home and still have that communication, um, there's still a lot of potential um, power to reduce some of those um, inequities. So I thought that was actually, to me, the most um, exciting finding uh, of the report. I will say, um, I think that the other piece which we weren't able to uh, explore, maybe we will in the discussion, is around determining appropriate antihypertensive medications and titration of medications in the inpatient and outpatient settings. And I'm what I'm really excited about is there might be um, in the near future a potential role for uh, AI to help us in really um, unpacking that question because it's something that we haven't been able to really um, define clearly in uh, the studies that exist so far, but could be an opportunity in the future to look at. So um, excited about the report and uh, we'll turn it back over to you, Lisa, for larger group discussion. Sounds great. The Megan and Rose, again, wonderful comments. Um, so thank you both again. And now I am going to invite Lucy uh, as we tag team today um, to broaden the conversation. So over to you, Lucy. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for this incredible discussion thus far. Um, while I'm waiting for people to chat in their questions or raise their hands, I want to start with a question to Ian, if I could. And Ian, this sort of dovetails off of the comment that you made on um, the caveat in terms of, you know, just because we don't find evidence of effectiveness for certain delivery strategies does not mean that they are not, the, you know, necessarily effective. So based on what you found in your report, what are the key opportunities that you see for healthcare providers to improve postpartum care practices? 
and ensure that you know women really receive the appropriate support, education, and follow up after childbirth that they need. Were there any you know sort of areas that are promising, if not um, really definitively effective? Yeah, sure, thanks, um, Lucy. Um, well, let me add a second caveat to that. One, one is the uh, apps, as you said, and, and I said in the chat, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, but. The other caveat is that when we, we are doing the systematic reviews, we are reviewing the evidence and we are summarizing that. We try to be very careful about not making uh, recommendations for practice, but that's sort of the next step. Um, and that's what ACOG is going to embark on. Uh, but with that, with, with both those caveats, I mean, uh, as we summarized, um, and I think in continuing with Rose's comment there that location, I mean, the rules just made location and our evidence found location did not seem to impact outcomes in this case. And that can be quite, um, um, quite useful information, especially in the context of the COVID pandemic and access to care issues. I mean, if virtual care can handle some of the issues related to postpartum care, and telephone care and so on. I think that has implications for care and that maybe certain aspects of, of postpartum care can be delivered remotely. Um, in terms of when and who, we found useful information that earlier postpartum, uh, earlier contraceptive care may be better. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 can be, can is useful clinical information. Um, the use of peer support and more social support networks for the important aspects such as breastfeeding care can make a difference, which is which is good information and useful. Um, reminders help, um, but I think the um, again emphasizing a point that Rose made in that, given the significant emotional and um, social challenges of everything that happens in the postpartum period and in the recent pregnancy period um, and the equipoise that we have found now among the various care delivery strategies. We, we I fully agree that giving patients um, options for these patient um, preference sensitive services really would be helpful, um, both in improving autonomy, access, outcomes, and their um, ownership of their own care to to a greater extent than has been done typically. Great, thank you. And this, I'm going to start reading from the chat because we're getting some really interesting um, questions and observations there. Um, and this goes to both of you, but we'll start with Dale in response. Um, and I think this is really interesting. A long time ago in the Indian Health Service, home visits um, were left, um, were, were the norm for all postpartum mo moms. It was a public health nurse function. And I know that, you know, having lived in North Carolina, there was a long history of public health nurses doing in-home visits postpartum. I'm just wondering what we could do in the if the US had more robust public health program. Dale, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, you know, I think the US is a very heterogeneous place and what one of the overarching questions is how well does any system transport to rural areas where access to mm -hmm. uh, cell phone coverage certainly internet may be much more limited and other marginalized groups such as american indian alaska natives people uh, who are low income and have less access to obstetrical care and live in obstetrical deserts. Um, so, I, so I think there is not one America. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other, I, I was thinking as the question was being asked about one of the, there, there's uh, one of the single arm trials is from India um, and was done during COVID and uh, used the pregnancy uh, helper uh, a concept that uh, many of the other trials, and so they actually, prior to discharge, taught uh, the the pregnant person's companion how to perform blood pressure monitor monitoring, mm -hmm. and recognize the importance of sort of social support in general. Uh, so I think, from my personal perspective, sort of a combination of high tech, high touch, may be the best solution. Thank you. Ian, any thoughts about that? 
No, I think Dale covered um, uh, yeah. what I was thinking there. Yeah. Yeah, I know just from my own work, when we interviewed public health nurses about their home visits for postpartum care in North Carolina, and this was years ago now, um, one of the things that they also found useful was to actually have somebody in the home that they could make recommendations about, you know, physical changes in the environment that might make it safer or more com um, compatible with the with child rearing experience, especially in early, you know, childhood. Um, and I see here in the comments that in the UK, it's routine postpartum care via health visitor in the home. So um, other other countries, there's room to learn. Um, I'll start with you, Ian. The, the question is, what gaps in the evidence did you see that really need to be filled at this time? And then I'll take it to Dale. Yeah, um, I think an important gap is that I think we need more studies on general postpartum care. We had a little bit of trouble as we were engaging with the project and picking it and even doing it as to how we are defining that. Um, we, as you, as everybody knows, I think uh, postpartum care involves a range of different care, preventive and therapeutic uh, care, as well as breastfeeding, et cetera. But we, most of the conclusions that we were, that we were able to make with were about things like contraception and breastfeeding care, but it's not quite clear to us um, of, we weren't able to make too many conclusions about the, that broader general postpartum care. So I think we need studies that address the holistic aspect of postpartum care more than have already been done. So that's one. Mm -hmm. the, um, couple of other things. So one is the, the outcomes of interest. So as I mentioned, uh, we engaged with uh, a range of stakeholders early in the process, including patients for getting their sense of uh, what should we be measuring in this systematic review, recognizing that the studies may re report a range of outcomes. So what is important for us? Uh, what is What are the key aspects here? And those are the ones you saw um, listed out on our slides. Um, but things like um, uh, maternal morbidity, um, I mean, we've had things like healthcare utilization, but studies may not report maternal morbidity or mortality um, and and related important outcomes. So that's, I think there's a gap there in terms of, like even the health insurance extension question. Mm -hmm. We have information about healthcare utilization, but to what extent does that improve outcomes? And recognize that it's a little downstream, but having that information would be useful. And a caveat there was that we, our, step off, our um, review was focused on just one year after delivery. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that some, there are studies that are done and perhaps in the hopefully in the future will be done that look at um, the impact of insurance expansion or extension on outcomes that go on into two years, three years, five years, or ten years down mm -hmm. the line. See to what extent does that make a difference? Great, thank you, Dale. Anything to add? I think from putting on my methodologist hat, uh, you know, we had very few clinical uh, randomized controlled trials, but I, I think it illustrates the power of, of controlled trials. And, and in this space, uh, comparative trials are clearly needed uh, to compare various strategies, both of which involve uh, access to home blood pressure measurements. Um, and I, I think in terms of outcomes, uh, we're quite limited with when it comes to we have some patient, we have very few patient reported outcomes and even fewer patient reported experience measures. And uh, I think those are particularly important to consider going forward. Yeah, I, one of the comments here, um, I'm gonna read to you Dale because I, I think it sort of adds on to this. Um, what are the remaining or specific research questions to, mu to move high blood pressure monitoring into standard of care? Do we really need evidence of direct impact on maternal mortality and morbidity before it becomes endorsed? How would you react to that, Dale? I, I, I'm not sure I have the clinical context to answer that question, but um, we did point out that the bump one and bump two trials in the antepartum period uh, you know, we're designed to answer those sorts of questions. And by my 
um, somewhat uh, naive reading were, were a bit underwhelming. Uh, the potential in the postpartum period may be greater, uh, particularly in the, uh, you know, in that area between the early postpartum period and then uh, longer term health outcomes um, yeah. and, and preeclampsia as a risk factor. But I, but I think one needs to be skeptical that uh, we can't necessarily solve this problem with technology or AI uh, and need more evidence both from pragmatic trials and from qualitative assessments of what individuals need uh, as they're quite individual. Great, thank you. I, 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 I've got a question that was sort of spurred by one of the earlier questions that I asked you, Ian, um, in terms of, you know, the, the appropriate support education and follow up after childbirth. Um, you know, in, in your report, did you uncover anything about like specific education directed at the mothers prior to postpartum period? You know, I, I, it was probably 40 years ago now for me, but I don't remember them ever discussing anything related to my health post delivery. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, what would that education look like? Um, was there any information about that that you uncovered? So uh, we had some initial conversations about that particular, I guess, um, let's call it a delivery strategy for now right. of giving education in the antepartum period. But uh, for the purpose of this review, we could consider it a, a little out of scope because mm -hmm. we, were focused, we were focused on interventions delivered in the postpartum period um, and around the late antepartum period. But um, in some ways, that's a little artificial because I fully agree with what you're saying that for postpartum outcomes, and it's been shown much um, antepartum health also predicts postpartum outcomes. So some of these aspect of aspects of delivery of interventions may have may have impact. And I think there is a broad body of evidence about that, it, but it's just that it, it, for this for the purpose mm -hmm. of our review, was that considered out of scope. Very helpful. Um, and and a question to either of you, and you know, looking at postpartum visits, did any studies um, included discuss IPV and other you know sort of challenging situ life situations? Ian, you may want to go first on that. Yeah, um, I'm having a bit of a brain freeze. Can can you just spell out IPV for me, Lisa? Interpersonal violence, domestic violence, uh, but those those issues. Right. Um, not to my recollection, um, at least not among the studies that were eligible for the review. So we had, um, as part of postpartum care, we had um, including mental health care, but, but I'm trying to recall the body of evidence that we found as to whether we found studies addressing this. Um, not, not to my recollection. Yeah. Yeah. And and one final question before I turn it back to Lisa and we bring in the discussants again, um, and I'm not sure who wants to take this, but was postpartum violence and drug use evaluated or included in those social determinants of health factors and how accurate tracking of ICD-10 codes were uh, in tracking morbidity and mortality data in the fourth trimester? Do either of you have any information on that? So, um, we did look at outcomes related to drug use or substance use. Um, I think we presented a couple of conclusions related to that. Um, but in terms of managing the substance use, um, mm -hmm. we, we did not consider intervention specifically as addressing substance use disorders as part of this, because remember, we are trying to make conclusions about postpartum care in general, to, or do we are trying to form conclusions about postpartum care in general. But um, yeah, those, I, I do not deal whether that came up in the hypertension review. We didn't find any studies that reported those measures. Yeah. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of work that needs to be done. This has been a really rich discussion. Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you to bring in our discussants. Great. Thank you, Lucy. And, and thank you to everybody who's 
posting comments and resources and and questions in the chat and keep keep doing that because we want to bring you in as well. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, you know, some uh, this part of the program is we, we really kind of want to dig into some of the issues that have come up around policy, equity, health systems implementation. Uh, again, Academy Health's role in supporting the Scientific Resource Center and the evidence based practice program is really to help, you know, knowledge and awareness of these important evidence tools that are being generated. But also to help you know un better understand how to support implementation and that can be done through systems through policy and how do we make sure that implementation and use really drives equity, which is such an important dimension of maternal health. So let me start by asking Megan, who you know is this whiz at what ACOG does with all this evidence. And can you tell us a little bit like an overview of how does ACOG clinical guideline development process use these reviews and then how are those guidelines you know then translated into initiatives and member facing etc so give us a bit more of a window into that process and ACOG's role so systematic reviews are critical in our guidance development we have a number of different document types clinical practice guidelines um, clinical consensus position statements committee statements so these um, evidence reviews really help inform those documents and when we're developing the documents you know the documents can take 18 24 months to develop and we really want to focus on answering those clinical questions that um, our members need help with that they need a deep dive into the evidence to um, implement into practice what you know what is what does the evidence say to do in the clinical setting so once we develop, you know, a clinical practice guideline on hypertension in pregnancy, or for example, those are then used by various aspects, you know, various um, departments at ACOG for, you know, policy position, advocacy, initiatives um, to move forward, um, you know, women's health. And some examples of those are we have an obstetric emergencies program, which is focused on collaboration with other specialty societies, recognizing that um, postpartum women and individuals may show up in the emergency room or in an urgent care clinic or pediatric setting. There's they, you know, they can show up anywhere over that one year period and recognizing that um, something may be pregnancy related, you know, showing up in an urgent care setting with um, high blood pressure, at, in, in at least asking, have you been pregnant in the past year? So really using this sort of guidance, this sort of evidence review to inform guidance, to inform an initiative where we can work with other specialty societies to develop the tools and the action plan to work with other societies to recognize pregnancy and then how to manage those patients that present in those settings, that's critically important. And then also one of ACOG's big you know, policy initiatives is expansion of Medicaid to the one year mark. And so this sort of evidence review informs clinical guidance, which then our policy team can translate into additional work on moving forward for this expansion. You know, we're now at 35 states in the District of Columbia, and we wanna keep that moving forward um, because so much of this is in, is critical, you know, making sure that we have access to care and, you know, we want to talk about mental health and blood pressure and contraception, but the baseline is ha actually having access to care for that year. So we really want to make sure that that care is at least available. And that's where that's the, that's the baseline. We want to have that care available, accessible, and that's where we need to start from. So we really value these documents they're critically important to our work um, and it's a critical partnership with arc and pecori and developing these um, so it's just again I, I can't say enough about how how much we appreciate working together and how much um, we just value this relationship Sorry, uh, thank you. And and a couple of comments in reaction to your important points is the the multi specialty perspective is so important. And again, 
kind of patient story. I was hospitalized, you know, presented at an ED with 104 fever about seven weeks postpartum, you know, after my twins were born and short, you know, turned out retained products, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, dealt with the ED, had it was a rule out infective endocarditis, so cardiologist, all kinds of things. So really that pregnancy event, even when it might have been six months earlier, it's just so important to to, uh, to work across specialties. So I was really glad you brought that up. It's a little bit of a patient reality story there. Um, and there was something else you said that I thought was really, oh, uh, important, which is, um, and, and this is a question, I, I'm a pediatrician and I know the AAP has state chapters and I'm assuming ACOG does as well. And so, you know, over 50% of the births in this country are paid for by Medicaid. So that action is all playing out at the state level. So what's the, how does ACOG get these, you know, various evidence-based tools that you've described? You know, what's the role of the state chapters and understanding it's not just about the, the federal um, sort of policy changes that are needed, but also the state policy changes. So we also, we have a federal and state policy teams. And so, um, you know, and we don't have state chapters necessarily. We have sections, which you know, actually break down to, you know, states, but obviously states with larger populations like California or New York have multiple sections and we have leadership, you know, structures in those sections. And we work closely to make sure that this information, you know, clinical guidance is available to all our members so that they can use it in their advocacy efforts and work closely with our state team to know that this is available and a critical part in their work at the state level. Great, great, great to hear that. Thank you. And then the, the final comment, and I'm not expecting a response, but I want to make sure that the audience understands that this post this you know importance of understanding the 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 role of the pregnancy event in uh, a woman's health uh, and whatever she's presenting with is further now complicated since the Dobbs decision of the Supreme Court and uh, practitioners on the front lines are uh, grappling depending on which state they're in with a lot of very complicated legal ethical frameworks in trying to provide the best possible care for women who present with uh, potential pregnancy complications. Um, so if you're interested in more on that topic, the National Academies is doing work in that area, but I, I just think it, it really speaks to how important the evidence base is to inform uh, clinical practice as the context of that practice changes over time. Um, one last question for you, Megan, before I turn to Rose, uh, and then we'll open it up. And I'm also, I'm trying to keep track of the chat. I'm not seeing, uh, a bunch more questions coming in yet, but don't forget, we're here to answer your questions, so please post them. But one of the things is Dale's report, um, and you've spoken to this, but you know it really talked about postpartum hypertensive disorders. And so as ACOG, you know, because I know ACOG does more than just produce the guidance, have you done or are you thinking about ways of doing other initiatives that actually work on that care coordination, whether it's, you know, learning communities or, cause I know you've worked with HRSA on other improvements to maternal health um, so that we really get to the goal of the seamless transition during the postpartum period, getting women in front of, and you know, not necessarily physically in front, we just heard about location is less important, um, but that care coordination, ensuring that we have sort of the right care in the right place from the right provider for a woman's needs during the postpartum period. That's a great question, and I think that that is also part of this larger obstetric emergencies program that we are working on is, you know, working with the program is ACOG and at least 18 other specialty societies. So really looking at all of these organizations and collaboratively developing tools to, um, you know, meet women and individuals where they are. So it's a great opportunity to um ensure that at least pregnancy is on the radar of all these various specialty societies um so that's one aspect we look at we also have the alliance for innovation and maternal health so that's a great program and um we have numerous programs and i think it's just something moving forward the collaborative aspect of it is really important recognizing that there are many ways that all different societies and specialties can impact maternal health. 
and improve maternal morbidity and mortality and trying to find ways that we can all work together to make that better. So that's definitely the direction we're working into trying not to think of it as the siloed things. It's something that we're all part of making better. Yeah, it's really I, given the situation and the statistics of serious maternal morbidity and mortality and the incredibly shocking disparities. Um, it really is an all hands on deck kind of situation. So really glad to hear you say that. I want to um, turn to Rose now and bring you into the conversation, Rose. Um, and, and sort of focus on the equity dimension of not just, we know there's an equity challenge, it's, it continues to be documented again. So pervasive and so serious and so tragic, but again, we want to focus on implementation and action. So you, you see this, not just in your research rows, but also in your clinical practice where you work. So how can healthcare organizations like the one you work in and others that you've worked with, as well as the policymakers that create that context for the healthcare organization, what can what what do you see as the way to use this evidence to really ensure equitable postpartum care for all women? So much, uh, such a big, big question. Um, we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about that alone, but I'll share a few a few thoughts. I would love to hear from folks in the chat too. Um, when I cut, when I think at all about health equity um, related to pregnancy, I often uh, turn to Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones and her strategy for uh, the national campaign against racism. And what she has proposed is really three steps. One is naming racism, two is identifying the levels at which racism is operating, and three is organizing and strategizing to act. And that's just a framework that I've found helpful and I apply in all conversations around health equity. And I think that in, in terms of step number one, I think in the past five years, we have made some progress in actually naming racism as a public health crisis and as the root cause of inequities that we continue to see in health. And we know that this has been magnified um, because of the lens of the COVID pandemic, um, which was not anticipated, but happened also within the last five years. And so I think that there is growing um, recognition um, in, and comfort in naming that racism really is the root cause of a lot of the inequities that we see, at least the race, the racial and ethnic inequities that we see in health outcomes. In terms of the second, uh, the second step, which is to identify the level at which racism is operating, I really think through all of the different levels um, and all of the different actions um, that can be taken to address uh, racism as it exists in those levels. So starting with the most broad, like structural level, um, structural racism, really we need to address the structural determinants of health and we need to have a societal transformation around how we think about the fourth trimester. I mentioned earlier, I mean, the things that I hear about every day in my clinic are the housing crisis, food insecurity, job insecurity, insurance discontinuity. Um, and these are structural things that beg structural and policy solutions. Uh, we've talked a little bit about expanding Medicaid. Um, one population or several populations um, that we haven't talked about are um, undocumented individuals um, who I have the privilege of seeing at a, at a community health center and who are not eligible for a lot of health services um, because of their legal status. I think we also, we talked briefly about um, the role of addiction specialists and wraparound programming for full spectrum recovery, knowing that uh, substance use disorder is also a driving um, condition for a lot of maternal morbidity and mortality. And the other piece we talked about is expanding our perinatal mental health workforce. I think that uh, we really are um, in a crisis around mental health and we don't have enough um, of the mental health workforce available to connect people uh, who need help. I think the demand far outs outseeds the supply and these are larger societal kind of structural issues that need to be addressed. The other thing that I mentioned is a societal transformation around how we think about postpartum care in the fourth trimester. And again, um, I think similar to some of the comments earlier, I think it's only very recently that we've begun to value the postpartum period as much as we have the pregnancy period, the childbirth moments, child development. Uh, someone I earlier mentioned how um, 
I think Lucy had mentioned how she hadn't, there were very few questions about her personal health and her postpartum visits and ev there was this, all this focus on the baby. And I know that um, Allison Stuby, one of the MFMs at UNC Chapel Hill often says, you know, we treat uh, pregnant individuals as like the wrapper and the babies as the candy. And we tend to focus a lot on like newborns and child development, but there seems to be a relative um, sort of less of attention spent on um, the pregnant person after they've actually given birth. And so in that postpartum period, it's really critical that we as a society really understand all of the social, emotional, physical, um, all of the vulnerabilities that happen in that postpartum period and actually um, develop structures and support systems in place to help people through that. There was a few comments earlier about interpersonal violence screening, um, critical in the postpartum period. We actually know that um, interpersonal violence is one of the leading causes of homicide and death among people within the first year after giving birth. Uh, thinking about gun, like the intersection of gun control and also thinking about paid parental leave policies. I live in a state uh, where we recently passed a much more progressive paid parental leave policy, but I recognize that we are an outlier and many states still have quite restrictive um, parental leave policies. So again, having a social transformation around the fourth trimester and really thinking about what does that mean for us as a society to really support individuals as they transition from pregnancy to parenthood. When I think about the institutional level, there is a lot that we can advocate for our institutional leadership to do. And so some of the things that I'm working on in our academic medical center is how can we really apply an equity lens to our QA and QI processes? And inclusive of that is how do we make sure that patients' voices and their experiences are informing our QA and QI approach to reducing inequities that we see within our sphere of influence? Um, so part of that is, you know, acknowledging the expertise of patients and their lived experiences and um, really including them as partners in, in the work of how we can improve our systems to have more equitable outcomes. One of the areas that I'm particularly passionate about is language justice. I see over 80%, 80 over 80% of the patients that I see are Spanish speaking immigrants and um, I tell you the trials that they see in just trying to navigate our health system in a language that is not English is a daily um, insurmountable challenge. And so really thinking about our institutions and how we can apply language justice throughout our, throughout our institutions. How can we have signage that's more welcoming? How can we actually provide people with instructions about their medications and their discharge planning in their own language? Um, how can we really meet people's um, linguistic needs when it's often um, assumed that either they don't have any or that we simply can't do anything about it? So these are some very concrete things that we can work on at institutional levels. Another thing that we need to think critically about is the exp is expanding um, the diversity of our healthcare professions workforce. And I'm not talking only about physicians, I'm talking about nurses, I'm talking about nurse practitioners, I'm talking about every part of the healthcare journey. We need to recognize that we need to have a diverse and inclusive workforce that really um, promotes particularly people of color so that when patients enter our healthcare system, they feel um, that they are welcomed, they feel like they are not alone. Uh, and so these are efforts I know that are happening in many spaces, but we need to continue, um, continue to work on. Uh, related to that, I know a lot of institutions, even state policies, have actually um, implemented implicit bias training. I think it is important that we acknowledge that we all carry biases, and those do come out in healthcare delivery decisions and the way we interact with patients and with each other. And so I think that um, there's another question around what kinds of implicit bias training are most effective in terms of how do we really demonstrate um, behavior change, and that I think has is a another ripe area perhaps for a systematic review. But I think uh, there's been certainly a movement and a recognition that we all have implicit bias. It definitely affects how we deliver care, how we interact with each other, and we need to do more in terms of integrating um, reflection and um, uh, awareness of that in as early as medical school and nursing school training, and it needs to be a continual development through that it's ongoing um, as people continue uh, to work in the healthcare field. 
The last few things I'll mention at the institutional level are we really need a proactive multimodal approach to really meet patients where they are. And I worry, I try to worry more about the patients who do not show up in my clinic than the patients who do. And so while I wanna give all my attention to the people sitting in front of me, I also need to make space for thinking about the people who don't make it, who fall off my schedule because they didn't keep the appointment, but why did they not keep the appointment? What is going on in their lives that they are not able um, to engage in the healthcare system? And so in that setting, I think community health workers, doulas, cultural brokers, we talked about visiting nurses, all of those people um, are so important for meeting meeting people where they're at, especially if they're not able to physically show up at a doctor's appointment, for example. And then lastly, I will say we talked a little bit about um, the the importance between um, connections between OBGYNs and other specialists, pediatricians or um, cardiologists. But I think there's a, still a very fragile transition between OBGYNs and primary care doctors. And I think that that transition is not well developed in all health organizations. And that is a critical one, especially as we think about this year postpartum. How do we effectively transition care, particularly for people with chronic medical conditions or specific conditions that require ongoing follow-up, perhaps beyond what an OBGYN's area of expertise is. And I think um, if there are ways we can innovate around um, real handoffs, like meaningful handoffs, transitions of care between OBGYNs and PCPs, I think that would be really, really helpful. The last level is the interpersonal level. And so as I mentioned earlier, I think thinking about how we interact with each other, and that's within the healthcare space, but also between healthcare teams and patients, is really focusing on how we can build trust, starting particularly in prenatal care and acknowledging that trust needs to be earned, um, especially among communities that may have experienced historical or intergenerational or even current trauma within the healthcare system. And so I think there's a lot that needs to be done around thinking about relationship quality and um, how we need to counsel and do anticipatory counseling around the postpartum period, starting in the prenatal care um, space. And then also individualizing that based on people's journeys, like based on what happens in prenatal care and what happens during childbirth, making sure that there's always a tailored approach to what is actually happening um, throughout that time uh, with the patients. And lastly, I think just having um, a growth mindset and remaining humble in that mistakes do happen and we all need to continue to learn and grow and um, challenge the systems that we're in uh, because if not, it's really hard to accomplish any of these things. So those yeah. were just uh, some of my thoughts about that. Great. Um, and I do see that um, Megan's hand is up and after I call on Megan, there's some Wonderful questions in the chat, but I want to actually Jenny Dalton from Picori, her mic is now working. So I want to give her an opportunity to say what she wanted to say at the beginning. But Megan, go ahead. So just to I actually saw this question in the chat and maybe you're going to get into it and it kind of goes along with what um, Rose is talking about with disparities and equities. And I wanted to talk about the um, the digital equities and disparities. And that's something that um, you know, we thought about it ACOG, but it really came to the forefront immediately with the start of COVID. How do we transition prenatal care and postpartum visits in a digital world? How do we think about this, you know, telemedicine, virtual visits, et cetera, when um, there are already maternity care deserts? And what disparities does that create? Um, people not having access. So. It is something that we consider a lot in our guidance. Um, and I think we're gonna start, you know, just I did a quick search on PubMed. We're already starting to see, you know, the articles and the data coming out about um, disparities related to telehealth and virtual visits. And there are challenges and barriers. And there are a lot of social determinants of health around this that need to be considered. So it's not, you know, it's not, we can't, it's, it's individualized. We can't just say like everyone have a telehealth visit. Um, there are a lot of considerations in telehealth and virtual care, and those need to be considered in an individualized way. And um, I, that's something that we really think through at ACOG when we 
pull together our guidelines. You know, for example, with COVID, we created frequently asked questions just to help our clinicians, you know, get information out as it came. And, and that was something that we really had to think through is how do we incorporate telehealth, but also consider populations that don't have access to that. How do we ensure that we're not creating um, more barriers or we're not creating greater disparities when we talk about this? So I really appreciate Lucy bringing that up that, um, you know, we really want to think about think through this when we talk about um, telehealth and virtual visits. It's not just a one size fits all and it's not something that everyone can do. Great, great point, Megan. Thank you. Um, so, Jenny, I understand we might be able to hear your voice. I think so. Is it working now? Can you hear me now? Yep. Great. I can hear you beautifully. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'll just give a, apologies for the earlier technical glitch. Um, and thank you to ARC and Academy Health for this opportunity, but I'll just say a few words, not what I was gonna say before, but just a more truncated version, but after hearing from these terrific authors and discussants and all the great conversations, but um, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about PCORI and how it um, collaborates with ARC and why PCORI chose to support these reviews. Um, PCORI was authorized, it's an independent nonprofit research organization that was authorized by Congress in 2010 and reauthorized in bipartisan fashion in 2019. And we focus on funding patient-centered clinical comparative effectiveness research, seeking answers to real-world real world questions about what works best for them. And PCORI is also fundamentally committed to ensuring patients and other healthcare partners are meaningfully engaged in all aspects of our research. As of March 2022, PCORI had committed over $3.4 billion to fund more than 1,900 projects across the United States. And, um, but in addition to funding clinical effectiveness research, PCORI's legislation also mandates that we help individuals make better informed healthcare decisions through evidence synthesis, specifically even systematic reviews and through disseminating findings. And uh, what came up in part of the 2019 reauthorization was that in addition to its broader mandate, the court was mainly tasked with also specifically focusing on two major areas, one being maternal morbidity and mortality, and the other being intellectual and developmental disabilities. McCory's approach to addressing maternal health is multi-pronged. It always starts with input from research partners as the foundation of our efforts, just like we do in all our work. But um, we have chosen to address maternal health through funding comparative effectiveness research, through engagement awards that involve partners in the research process, and through funding evidence synthesis work, which is what was discussed today. After the research is done, McCory then works to disseminate those findings to inform end users of all kinds, such as partners, patients, providers, medical societies, and caregivers. Overall, McCory has committed over $130 million to improve maternal health in the U.S. Um, I also just want to note and um, express gratitude for the important relationship McCory has with the Agency for Global Research Quality. We work, our two organizations work collaboratively, collaboratively in many ways around the shared goal of helping people make better healthcare decisions. And um, our complementary and collaborative work includes things like the Learning Health Systems Workforce, research data infrastructure, and in disseminating and implementing new research findings. Um, working Today, as you've heard, we focus mostly on the evidence synthesis projects, but um, ARC and PCORI have completed 10 systematic reviews covering a variety of topics. Um, and they, we also have eight ongoing ARC reviews. Um, PCORI supported ARC reviews on various topics and um, nominated, nominated by various medical societies, including um, the American Society of Anesthesiology, Congress of Neurological Surgeons, American Neurological Association, and many others. And we have many more to come. And um, we, we relied heavily on research partner input to identify the topics that came up today. And I noticed that some of the people on this call today were some of the people we spoke to. Um, but we spoke with clinician groups, advocacy groups, patient groups, caregivers, and researchers in advance to take on these reviews. And um, we are grateful for the collaboration we've had with ACOG. We've gone, we've done three systematic reviews with them in the past several years, and 
We know that PCORI, ARC, and ACOG will all work to disseminate the findings and continue to do so, and ACOG will use them to inform medical guidelines like Megan talked about. And um, again, really appreciate this opportunity for these um, findings to be highlighted. Appreciate ARC and um, the Academy, Academy Health, and also the authors and the discussions today. So really appreciate it, and thanks for your time. Thank you, Jenny. Wonderful. Glad we got to hear from you. Um, so I want to turn back to some of the questions in the chat because they are fantastic. Um, so um, going to uh, the question, the question from Mitchell Abramsky. Sorry for mispronouncing. Um, and this is a question for Dr. Molina. How do you address systemic racism with health departments in Republican controlled states like Florida that have passed laws banning discussion of systematic racism? Uh, or systemic racism, however, or um, so I'm not sure if uh, that's a tough question. I personally live in Florida, so I'm experiencing as it this issue with uh, as we speak. But uh, Rose, did you want to uh, respond? Uh, I'm happy to respond. Uh, obviously, a very hard question, and I admit fully that I have the privilege of uh, living in a state where that policy does not exist, and so, and nor have I ever lived in a state where such a policy did exist. So, I personally have no lived experience of trying to address that from the context of um, having to uh, sort of deal with state policies that are contrary to my personal and professional beliefs and code. Um, however, what I would say is a couple of things. First of all, I acknowledge, um, as Lisa said, that many of you here may live in those states. And I would turn to those of you who are doing the work in those states in terms of strategies that you find to be effective. As I, I, I live and work in Massachusetts, and so um, I've been very fortunate to not have to personally wrestle with this issue. I will say from other issues that I have wrestled with that might be similar, I think that one of the things that guides me is, while I think it is important to name racism, I think the work behind being anti-racist is equally important, if not more important. And so I think there are still ways to have an impact if it's the word, if it's the buzzword that's causing the controversy then if you want to avoid the controversy and not use the word, I think that there's a space for that. I think the work still needs to be done. And I think the work can be done no matter where you are, no matter what institution you work in. Um, and my hope is that you would all find keep like other partners in this work because no individual can do this alone. And so my hope is that for people who are in those states that you're able to find your community, find others, bring them into your community and still advocate for the changes that we all need to see to really advance equity. And so, yes, there may be some level of censorship based on different sort of state policies, but the work that needs to be done still doesn't change. In fact, I would argue is even more important in those areas. So, um, but finding your, your group, your village is important. Yeah, no, great point. I want to turn to a question from Yaneko for for both of uh, of our our discussants and 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 also authors, just the group in general. But before I do, uh, there was a question for you, Rose. If you could drop in the chat that uh, Camera Jones framework that you use to structure your remarks, that would be very helpful if you have that handy. So Yaneko asked about um, what are the priorities for implementation studies to move evidence into practice, and I want to sort of you know, elaborate on that or take my prerogative as 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 discussing uh, chair here of um, particularly Megan, as you and, and ACOG work with all the partners you've mentioned in all your other remarks so far today, um, has this come up? Like people say, well, how do we implement? You know, what's, you know, so I want to get to the point about, again, what is the evidence needed in the implementation space to really achieve better outcomes for maternal health? So. Who wants to go first in taking that one on? And I can't see you all. My screen is not big enough, so don't raise your hand. Just speak. My first thought, um, just from a guideline development process, is cutting down on the actual time of implementation of guidelines. You hear, you know, you hear the the adage that it takes so many years to actually see guidelines 
implemented in practice. And so learning those implementation techniques so that new guidelines are actually implemented quickly instead of seven years later, 10 years later. Um, that is my first reaction. This is a great panel and I look forward to everyone else's thoughts too, but just really cutting down on how long it takes to get things is critical. Great, great point. Ian or Dale, any comments from, from your expertise, not just the reports, but obviously you're, you're producing evidence, you wanna get it used. Yes, yes, yeah, sure. Um, so one of the, just tying back to the report that I presented, so one of the things that we did not find evidence on, and that's what's coming up here, is on interventions to promote, I mean, interventions targeting healthcare providers. Uh, but I think we were also looking at interventions targeting systems to promote guideline adherent care. Um, the, I mean, it's, it's, I'm going to sound like a stuck record now in that, we did not find adequate evidence to do that, to, to make any conclusions for that particular um, aspect. Um, there are studies that are out there in other fields that have addressed interventions to improve guideline adherent care. I think there it's an important area that this field for specifically in care of postpartum individuals needs to do more research on. But there are lessons that can be learned in terms of, I mean, clinical decision support tools are quite now quite widely used in other fields, but even thinking about that more broadly as well. So an area ripe for research, an area ripe for implementation science, scientists to go in there and actually get some of this done. Terrific. Great point, Ian. I'm going to move to a, another question as we're, we're sort of in the last 15 minutes of our time together and all while somebody's answering it, I will drop some resources in to build on Ian's point about implementation science. So Lucy had a question um, here about the, how one strategy that health systems are using is to refer patients and uh, to community-based organizations. So are you aware of any states or local communities who are leveraging these CBOs to support women during the postpartum period? And she specifically, Lucy calls out church groups, pastoral care nurses, La Leche League, et cetera. And there might be folks on the call as participants, as attendees who also are involved with some of those CBOs. Uh, so Rose, do you wanna maybe kick off an answer to that about working with CBOs given your experience? Yes, I, I think CBOs are really um, the secret sauce to doing a lot of the equity work. And I had the fortunate privilege of several uh, having several years of funding through the Boston Foundation to really work with local organizations in the Boston area around really this issue of how do we um, enhance social support uh, in this transition from pregnancy to parenthood, given that a lot of the community-based organizations are doing that work. The challenge is that they're not always well integrated with the healthcare system and the healthcare system where people go to for their healthcare delivery is often um, not as well connected with what is happening in the community. And I think a special place are the community health centers um, that often have a network of CBOs that they collaborate with. But the reality is it's it's sadly a little bit of um, sort of by chance, depending on what door the patient may walk through in terms of which resource specialist knows about referring them to different community-based organizations or having those contacts or that network. And so that's something that we um, actually tried to work on a lot is how do we build a better system for coordination among CBOs? Because CBOs are often, um, sadly, there's a lot of turnover based on grant support. Um, a CBO that was uh, super active several years ago, especially in the context of the pandemic, may have shifted focus or changed, their funding structure might have changed or their area of work might have shifted a little bit. And so having systems that really help um, not just healthcare providers, but just individuals also navigate, well, what community-based organizations are out there that, what kind of services do they provide? How can I engage with them? Um, I think that it's a critical um, sector that is under, um, not as integrated as it should be with the healthcare system. 
Um, I think some of our earlier comments around doulas, uh, there's a lot of uh, community doula organizations, for example, that are also growing um, and have a little bit more of a specific entry point into pregnancy, obviously, because of the nature of doula work. But um, I think that that is definitely a space that needs to be further um, explored in terms of how can we build better connections between healthcare systems and community-based organizations. Great, great point. And um, a related initiative, not specific to maternal health, but is um, Kaiser Permanente has funded uh, the CDC Foundation to look at um, better understanding and supporting the role of community-based organizations in public health work. And so I think, uh, I think we're all just realizing how important it is to really be in the community and working with those sort of trusted uh, individuals and entities uh, that have long-standing roles in those communities. Um, we've, we've just got a, a five more minutes, so I want to take a, a last question from the chat, um, which is around um, you know the importance of primary care. And we talked, Megan talked about all the care coordination and multi-specialty, um, and so um, the issue around quality reporting measures. Do we have adequate quality reporting measures? Um, that OBGYNs should take on the primary care role uh, for the fourth trimester, as we're now uh, calling it. Um, so, any any takers on that one? Uh, it's uh, it's I was not familiar with uh, the the dimensions or the limitations of the quality reporting measures. And Crystal, if I if I've misread your question, please, if you're still on, uh, you know, feel free to elaborate in the chat. But. Um, Maybe I'll throw this to Rose first, so I don't put Megan on the spot. Um, but uh, but Megan, if there is a policy on this at ACOG, feel free to to chime in. I'm happy uh, to respond uh, again from my clinical perspective. I think that um, OBGYNs certainly can do and are uh, the primary care um, physicians for many young reproductive age people, uh, simply because. They often have reproductive health needs and may not know that they have other needs that need to be addressed and feel that an OBGYN is sufficient. I see this all the time. However, I also uh, strongly recommend to all of my patients that they have a primary care physician in addition to an OBGYN, especially because of the very real problem that I run into that I am not actually able to refer them for specialty care beyond the episode of pregnancy. I've gotten referrals bounced back um, when someone, when I make a referral and I am not listed as their PCP. And I can't explain all of the different um, policies and implementation challenges and administrative sort of barriers. But I do know that when a patient is not pregnant or within a certain window after pregnancy, if I try to make a referral to a specialist, it gets bounced back. Um, and I'm told that I can't do that until the patient is registered with a PCP, uh, which is a huge challenge because there's, I mean, there's just a shortage of PCPs. The wait, the wait list to get in to see a PCP is months long. And so, um, while yes, I think from a clinical perspective, of course, OBGYNs can actually do a lot of primary care stuff. Um, there's actually a lot of things that administratively we are not allowed to do, um, and we can't get patients through the system uh, if often they don't have a PCP listed for their insurance. Great, great point, Rose. Um, Megan, did you wanna jump in at all? You went off mute, so. Okay, I um I don't work on quality measures at ACOG, but this is a great question that I actually, you know, copied it. I'm gonna touch base with our quality measure um folks just because I haven't had this question come up before. So I really appreciate um bringing this up. So it's something I can look into. Thank you. Right. Ter terrific. Yeah, it's that's why um we benefit from all of your engagement because we think of new and different dimensions. Um, so, this has been just a fabulous discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Lucy for sort of the closing, but before I do, I just want to give Ian or Dale an opportunity for sort of any final comments based on our conversation and the work, the important work that you've led. Any final thoughts? And you could say, no, I'm good, but I just wanted to make sure I gave you that opportunity. Well, um, I'll just say from from our perspective, I mean, doing doing this sort of work, and it sounds like it's playing into the conversation, the broader conversation around 
both the future work research that needs to be done, but also the more, I guess, the more immediate guidelines that need to be developed to address the major problems that are um, facing the postpartum population and the disparities that are that this country is experiencing. So it is satisfying for us to be able to do that. But of course, uh, happy to engage with kind conversations like this. It helps us disseminate our work and it helps the work reach the decision makers, the right decision makers. Perfect. Dale? I was just gonna say that it's been an absolute pleasure to get to know many of the people who were uh, on this call and uh, to uh, apologies for uh, their time spent uh, hearing me ask uh, stupid questions about uh, clinical issues that I don't understand. But I, I think you know, one thing that's really clear is that these discussions uh, about systems and access to care and uh, apply well beyond uh, just maternal health. So uh, it's, it's been a great learning experience for me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I wanna thank our audience today. This has just been a tremendous discussion. The, the, the comments, the questions, and the resource sharing in the chat are really inspirational. So we wanna thank you for that. That's an important part of our success. I wanna note for you that um, Lisa did drop in a link to the Dissemination and Implementation Conference. Um, the DNI conference, it, it really focuses on implementation and implementation science. The abstracts are due July 18th and the meetings held December 10th through the 13th in Washington, DC. So if you are doing this work, we talked a lot about that being a gap. Um, here's a place for you to come and showcase your work that's in progress. Edie has up on the slide um, the QR code um, for um, continuing education credits. She also has a link in the chat if you're not able to use the QR code. And then finally, I just really want to thank our report authors, Ian and Dale, our discussants, Rose and Megan, and our partners at ARC, the SRC, and um, staff at Academy Health for making this possible. We'll share the meeting recording with you as soon as possible and announce the next EPC Grand Rounds theme very soon. So have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.